Okay, uh, we're back. This is the five to six block on uh, Think Tech Talks here, broadcasting from Pioneer Plaza on Ustream and Spreaker, and ultimately on YouTube and Oello 54. And we have today a special guest, a visiting fireman, as it were, <clears throat> made available to us by Mike Markridge. And his name, sitting to my left, is Greg Wiegand. He's the senior engineer and chief technical officer of a mainland company called Microplanet. More than that, he is the inventor of the Microplanet voltage regulator, which we are going to find out a lot more about in a minute. I'm Jay Fidel. Um, we're going to call this show Voltage Regulation and Tomorrow's Smart Grid in keeping with our ongoing examination of energy in Hawaii and elsewhere. So, welcome to the show, Greg. Thank you, Jay. What are you doing here, anyway? I'm here to talk to Hawaiian Electric and uh, check on some of our regulators that we have in Hawaii and just generally uh, some business development mm, with, okay. the, with the solar industry here. Yeah, they need you. Well, they're a little distressed at the moment. Yes, yes. we talked about that in, uh, one hour ago in great detail. Uh, we called it the implosion of the solar PV industry. <laughs> I don't know if you need to characterize it that way, but some people do. Well, I can uh, appreciate why some people would perceive it that way, <laughs> yes. So, I guess, uh, you know, uh, you, got, you got some of these devices installed already here in Hawaii? Yes, uh, they're scattered around the islands, and we, uh, I don't know, we first came to Hawaii about six or seven years ago, and we did a pilot demonstration for Hawaiian Electric and uh, it's kind of where it started in Hawaii. So they liked it well enough to incorporate it in some installations? Uh, Hawaiian Electric, no. Uh, it was originally part of their energy efficiency program mm. which then got spun off to yes, uh, right. Hawaii uh, Energy. Hawaii right. Energy uh, which then got took over by SAIC so it kind of uh, we kind of were, we kind of delayed pushing that program because we started to get a lot more traction in Australia. Hmm, Australia. We had somebody here from uh, Tasmania just a week ago, and uh, we were really surprised to find out how advanced they are in Tasmania. Uh, yeah, the whole Australian, that part of the world actually is uh, probably three or four years further down the road in terms of renewable energy than Hawaii, in my opinion. You know, I wouldn't disagree with that. It was clear. The young man who was here was completely vital, may I say energetic. <laughs> Not like <laughs> us, is that what you're saying? <laughs> it was a question of age, yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, first of all, uh, before we get to the actual invention, which I am very, very curious about, uh, what what factors made you the inventor? Uh, you were in the right time, the right place, with the right training and the right, you know, nurturing environment to become the inventor of this thing. Let's call it the microplanet voltage regulator. What were those factors? Well, um, as implausible as it may seem, actually, I worked in the motion picture industry, and that makes sense. <laughs> there are issues there when you're recording sound uh, and you want to dim the lights. Uh, the normal way to regulate the voltage to the light, which makes it dimmer and brighter, uh, creates noise in the lights. And when you have big lights, you have big noise. So uh, I was kind of struggling with that problem one day. and the thought occurred to me uh, that maybe there's a better way to do this and I, I'm kind of a dropout physics major that got distracted by being a photographer and working in the motion I picture business. I love it, business. what a great career. You, you go where your heart takes you. So yeah, so you know generally I think you'll find that disruptive technologies never originate in the industry that they disrupt. Interesting point. So I was perhaps naive enough to think that uh, this technology uh, could make a huge difference and I, I still hold that position today, although it hasn't happened quite as fast as I had envisioned. You mean a huge difference in the movie business? 
No, I mean outside of the movie business. And, Everywhere. Yeah. In the energy business. In the energy business. So the company that we founded actually got started, which is Microplanet. Um, you actually, were, you were a founder of the company. Yeah, I, I am one of the delusional founders of Microplanet. <laughs> yes, I like this company. And the uh, delusion is a good thing. <laughs> well, we we well, got be bound by reality test. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what's the fun in that? So uh, we actually were uh, basically got started by a grant from Bonneville Power Administration, and they wanted to study. Uh, what they call distributed voltage regulation. So utilities for many, many years, so well over 30 years, uh, have studied the effects of lowering the voltage by controlling their feeder line voltage. And you can save a significant amount of energy by doing that. But there's a limit to how much they can lower it because there's some uncontrollable variables from the distribution transformer to your building that they have no control over. So they said, hey, what if you could efficiently regulate the voltage right at the building? And that's where we came in. So it's a transformer, isn't it? Yeah, it's essentially you can think of it as a variable transformer and we can just tweak the voltage and it has very low losses, so it's efficient to do that. There's a lot of ways to regulate voltage, but they, all the traditional ways, either distort the voltage waveform and create other problems, or there's an efficiency issue. So, you know, if you're trying to save somewhere between three and 10% of the energy coming in, you don't want to waste 5% of it in the regulation stage. Yeah, so, sure. So our regulators, <laughs> if they're sized properly, have an average about seven-tenths of one percent loss. Very efficient. Very efficient. They're very fast. They react on a one-cycle basis. So... What do they react to? Changes in the incoming voltage. And you can program the outgoing voltage very precisely. So, so it's autonomous. You don't have to actually you know, send a message to it, it does it all by itself. Does it all by itself. So essentially what utilities do is because they have a very long feeder, they have a band of voltage that they deliver to your building and and it's plus or minus five percent of the nominal. So for a house, uh, 120 volts is nominal. Most people have no idea what voltage is. They only know whether they have electricity or not. Well, uh, when you flip your light switch on, the voltage to the light bulb goes from zero to 120 volts. So that's the middle of the band, and it can be as high as 126 and as low as 114. And what we do is we practice what's called voltage optimization and we hold the voltage right at a, the bottom level at 114. That's, that's what your device does. And if the utility voltage drops below that, we can actually raise the voltage and keep it right there at 114. I'm going to turn the voltage down on my phone here okay. because I, it's, I'm just kind of keeping in touch with your conversation. So we uh, started with a uh, grant from Bonneville Power. We built regulators for a, a, what they call a distribution efficiency initiative, which was a big three-year study with 11 of their member utilities. And then we kind of branched out into more commercial ventures. And we came to Hawaii thinking, well, the cost of power is quite high here. This makes more so how sense. how does a voltage regular, le, regulator affect the cost of power? When you reduce the average voltage that you get from the utility, the, av the voltage from the utility bounces around all day long and we just hold it steady right at the minimum. So however much that reduction is in real life represents a reduction in energy savings. And it's approximately for every 1% you reduce the average voltage, you get approximately 7 tenths of a percent energy savings and demand reduction. So, so, the, <clears throat> so the utility is delivering this kind of uh, jumping voltage 
within limits. And now your device is on the line. Your device delivers stable voltage yeah. at the nominal rate, whatever that is. Yes. <clears throat> and this somehow is it's more efficient, but this somehow saves energy. Where, where is the saving reflected? It basically comes from reducing the losses in the electronic appliances and motors. So in other words, they give off less heat. And because all these devices are giving off less heat, you also have lower air conditioning load. So you use less power. The guy inside who yeah. has the benefit of your device uses less power on his home appliances. Yep. Does that, now does that affect other things like amperage or wattage? It does, but it's, it's kind of maybe superfluous to the discussion, but different things react differently, but on the whole, it always saves energy, and we've done pilots in a number of commercial buildings and some residential. Uh, you know, we did pilots for Actus at the Navy Housing in Forest City, and uh, we've done everything from, uh, like, uh, if people are familiar with efficiency standards, there's the LEED mm -hmm. Silver, Gold, and Platinum, and we've done studies on lead platinum facilities which are supposedly absolutely state-of-the-art and you still get two and a half three and a half percent savings even then so it's just the physics of it yeah so, it's pretty universal but you're assuming in this discussion are you not that there is a there is a jumping voltage at, at the point of entry if suppose I give you a hypothetical, suppose the voltage at the point of entry doesn't jump so much. Suppose it it's straight, but it was 120 volts, whatever. I mean, perfect. Would would that make your device unnecessary? No, because uh, you can split the conversation into two parts. So the really bouncy voltage is a power quality issue. And that's what they call a flicker. And if your lights are kind of flickering around, it's the voltage. We can, yeah, it's the voltage changing rapidly, and we can fix that. But that's a different question than you know what's the average voltage coming in. So if, for instance, the average voltage coming into this building was only 118, and you reduced it to 114, you know. That's like a three percent reduction. Seven tenths of three percent is two and a half percent. So this out. probably wouldn't make economic sense just from that point of view. But if it was higher, what what happens is the utility tends to run their feeder line as high as they can, so the guy at the very end still has enough voltage because as you pull energy off the feeder line, the voltage drops. It's just it's a resistance on the line. Yeah, that's line losses. So. So if you're close to the substation, you're going to have high voltage, like 122, 123. And then you can drop at, you know, 8%. OK, so the idea is to take it when it's the wrong, when it's too high, mm -hmm. and to make it the right, and then you're saving energy at the end of it. Uh, you use less if you have a uh, the right level of voltage coming in. Yeah. Correct. Okay. And I, I just wanted to get the basic parameters yeah. down. Now we're going to take a break. Having that under our belt, you know, for digestive purposes. <laughs> That's Greg Wiegand, Senior in, in Engineer and Chief Technical Officer of MicroPlanet, an organization, a company that he founded, and uh, or was one of the founders, I guess. One of, yes. And uh, he is the inventor of the MicroPlanet voltage regulator, which we're studying today here on Think Tech Talks. I'm Jay Fidel with Broadcasting uh, on Ustream, Spreaker, and ultimately on YouTube, and uh, uh, Olelo 54 from Pioneer Plaza. We'll be right back after this short break. Aloha, I'm Nicole Horry for Think Tech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone Number 9 has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone Program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. 
DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Hori. Mahalo. We're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel and Think Tech Talks here on a Thursday in the 5 to 6 block from Pioneer Plaza with Greg Wiegand, senior engineer and CTO of MicroPlanet, talking about uh, his invention, the MicroPlanet voltage regulator, and that's why he's here. Um, we're talking about tomorrow's smart grid um, with uh, MicroPlanet. So, uh, to go to a question that you suggested in the break, namely, how does this affect solar? Solar is the word of the day. Everybody's, everybody's frantic about solar on both sides of the, on all sides of solar. Everybody's frantic about solar. How does this affect, um, you know, solar in the community, as it were? Well, tomorrow I leave for Australia, and Australia is several years ahead of Hawaii in terms of implementation of solar. So uh, Australia and Germany are quite a bit further ahead and there's several ways to deal with the problem from a utility perspective. The, the main, one of the main problems they have uh, that affects people directly is that when, as I was explaining before the break, uh, the utility tends to run the feeder line high at the beginning so they have enough at the end because it tends to reduce as you take energy out of the feeder line. But that same reduction then inverts when you're running power back the other way. So instead of having a voltage loss, like a net metering, you have a voltage rise. And if you have enough PV on the system, they have a voltage rise. And their system for a hundred years was based on the assumption that the voltage would only reduce and now all of a sudden it oh, flips. Very interesting. So it's really kind of turned them upside down because they set the whole system up so they start up here near the high limit uh, and they design everything so by the time they get to the end it's not too low. So you know to be fair to the utilities this is a major blow. And why? They, why? Um, well, because for a hundred years the assumption was voltage only goes down, not up. So, but what's the what's the negative about having it go back on, say, net metering and and get higher as it goes back to uh, the central place? Well, the problem is is it doesn't get it gets higher out here on the end. So, if this is the maximum limit, 126 volts, and you take this curve down and you flip it up, it doesn't take very much energy before the voltage at the end of the feeder is now too high. Too high. Yeah. Okay, so it would be higher than what the what the end, which is closer to the utilities generating equipment, uh, to what the end would tolerate. What happens what happens if the voltage that comes into that place is too high? What what are the dangers? Well if, you know stuff will start failing prematurely because uh, the losses are proportional to the square of the voltage, sorry for the math, but um, it just, stuff that's running starts getting hotter and hotter and eventually it'll fail. So it's heat, voltage yeah. creates heat. Yeah. And, and, and if you're beyond the voltage the system is built to take, you're going to get heat the system is not ready to handle. Yeah, so, you know, uh, PV inverters are supposed to shut off if the voltage gets that high. Which doesn't make on the roof. Yeah, I mean the and at the home. At the home, the inverter, which takes the DC energy from the solar panel and converts it to AC and pushes it out to the utility, it is required to shut off if the utility voltage at the home is too high. But which doesn't help people that invested all that money in their solar panels. So does it work? Does it actually shut off? Mm -hmm. They do, yes. So, okay, so, so let me give an example. So if this is supposed to be at well, 110 volts, I don't know, uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, 
nominal not, voltage. Not direct current, but alternating, alternating current, current out of the inverter, say, uh, and it goes too high because whatever happens on the panel or the inverter, then the inverter shuts off and there's nothing going back to the utility. Is that correct. Right? Okay. That's correct. And this is the way they all work? Yes. It's true. It's the way they're required to work. By the utility, because the utility doesn't want it too high. That's well. It's a it's a safety consideration. Okay, fair yes. enough. It's a safety standard. Okay, but doesn't that solve the problem you just described? Well, it does, except unless you paid all that money for the PV system, and now you're not getting uh, you're, not you're not getting, getting the, the credits. Benefit. Yeah, on the net yeah. metering. Okay. So in Australia, one of the things they realized is that. Um, the, for one, the government refused to let the utilities limit the penetration. So they were forced to deal with it. And so they formed a, a coalition and uh, funded research on how to resolve this problem. And our technology bubbled to the surface. And so now in Australia, about 70, 75 percent of the utilities are either using our technology or they're in serious trials to get the feel okay. of it. So using your technology means that there's a black box at the utility end of things, uh, right, which, in, which regulates the voltage coming back from the homeowner mm -hmm. on the return, on the net metering return, Right. that's going to hold the voltage low enough so it doesn't do any damage uh, doesn't get too high or do any heat damage uh, to the utilities equipment there. Yeah. Well, it's it's more a concern of the that it's not too high at the customer. At the customer's connection. End. Okay, yeah. so that's that's where you would put it. So the the well, utility. Why don't you put it at the utility end? Isn't that easier? We do, but. The utility is required to keep the voltage within this delivery range. So we put in Australia, because they have a slightly different system, they follow the European system, where they, if for one, it's 240 volts instead of 120, but they run what they call a, an LV feeder. So they take the medium voltage, they drop it down to 240, and then they'll run, you know, five, 600 meters of wire, and they'll have 50 or 60 houses or small businesses on that. Yeah. So it's somewhat easier for them to use our regulators at their distribution yes. transformer yes. to regulate this whole group of people. And sometimes if there's a lot of PV on this that feeder, that LV network, they'll put one in the middle of the feeder and one at the regulator. So then you get double control on it. Yeah, it basically takes the regulator essentially trades voltage for current and vice versa. Current means amperage? Current means amperage, yes. Okay. So if so the voltage is too high, we lower it and we we basically reduce the amount of amperage being consumed. If it's the voltage is too low, we take extra amperage and we convert it to voltage and make the voltage higher. So it basically exchanges one commodity for the other, so to speak. But are you primarily concerned with the voltage returning to the utility or coming from the utility, or both? Well, both. Uh, at night. So it can work either way. Yeah, at night, the, the energy is flowing from the utility, and everybody's cooking dinner, and there's no PV. And during the middle of the day, there's a lot of PV, so the energy may okay. well be flowing back to the utility. So, That's pretty crafty. So it's a bi-directional regulation. It's like a thermos. How does it, you know, I always make the joke about the thermos. How does it know? <laughs> How does it know? <laughs> anyway, well, that's a whole other show. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, and we're gonna I, and I'll need that. charts and graphs <laughs> for that. So uh, here we are with Greg Wiegand, senior engineer and chief technical officer of MicroPlanet, inventor of the MicroPlanet voltage regulator, which is popular in Australia, and I'm very impressed. And we're on a Think Tech Talks, emanating uh, from Pioneer Plaza here. Uh, we're talking about voltage regulation in tomorrow's Smart Grid. We'll be right back after this break.
I'm Bill Spencer, president of the Hawaii Venture Capital Association. We do monthly luncheon programs with ThinkTech about things that matter to Hawaii entrepreneurs, investors, and business service providers. So join us on the fourth Thursday of every month at the Plaza Club. For information about upcoming events or to join our mailing list, visit hvca.org. See you there. We're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel on Think Tech from Pioneer Plaza. We have Greg Wiegand, Senior Engineer and CTO of MicroPlanet. Where's Micro MicroPlanet's headquarters? Seattle. Seattle, where it should be, the land of technology. Uh, inventor of the MicroPlanet voltage regulator, and uh, he's here in Hawaii uh, to talk about his voltage regulator and uh, see if it can be adopted the way it has been adopted in Australia, where it has been adopted a lot. Um, so we were talking about how it would work with, uh, with, with photovoltaic, and I, and I wonder, I mean, it sounds like this is an element of the smart grid. It is part of the smart grid. It's smart. It, it, and I'm glad to use the word element because it's not the solution, but it's one of the tools that will eventually get people to where they're going. Now, the term smart grid means different things to everybody you talk to. Some people it's very amorphous actually. <laughs> yeah, I mean to some people it's all about communication, to others it's all about metering and you know knowing where your system is at and managing it and to others it's about you know automatic reconfiguration and self-healing and they're all very lofty goals and you know basically we're making it up as we go. So you know just to be Claire, you know, there are a lot of moving uh, pieces in this for the utility and it's in voltage regulation is just one of probably three or four major pieces they have to resolve. So. What are the others? Just, just to put it in perspective. Well, system protection, like they're basically they're circuit breakers. A utility has circuit breakers just like your house does, so if there's a fault or something shorts out, they can stop it. Okay. Uh, so system protection is a big deal. Uh, the other big problem is uh, power quality and how steady the PV or the wind energy is, and that's really a problem for them because it frequently is up and down and all over the place. So there are devices that will that you can put on the line to steady that power to smooth the curve? Well, if you were to put our regulators right at your house, that would take care of that problem. Suppose I put it on the other end of the windmill. I mean, on the windmill as the windmill is entering the grid. That's usually medium voltage, and we can't handle that level of power. So the way a utility deals with that is essentially energy storage to buffer the variations, which is another emerging technology. And Storage that, or buffer, I mean, is it the same thing? Yeah, so they store energy, yeah. and when the cloud comes over the PV, yeah. suddenly they need more energy, so they push energy onto the system. Well, what is the state of the art on that? Uh, because, I mean, you, know, you keep hearing that there really is no efficient way to do that. We don't have that here. We have we have some very limited installations. Extreme is the uh, manufacturer, but uh, we don't have enough of it to make a difference. It That's not my area of expertise, but I know that there are a lot of different ways of redux flow batteries and, you know, lithium-based systems and, you know, it's, it's batteries. Typically it's batteries, whether it's chemical storage or traditionally. Um, so it's really not my area of expertise, but it is one of the unsolved problems in the smart well, grid. Do you agree with me? I've had this recurrent dream of a, a capacitor about that big, okay, which would hold a charge until you wanted it. And if you put a lot of these things together, it acts as a battery, and it's cool, and it doesn't burn, and it can make you richer than Bill Gates ever imagined. There are what, what are called supercapacitors that are vying for that market, and 
you know, again, it's not my area of expertise. I know EPRI, which is the Electric Power Research Institute, has been testing some of that stuff. And, uh, you know, nobody's got the golden bullet. Um, but here's an interesting tie-in. Um, so protection, uh, energy storage, which buffers the volatile nature of uh, renewable energy. So as we discussed earlier, when you reduce the voltage, you reduce the amount of energy. So my, my proposal is if the utility wants to install this, they should set the regulator right in the middle. And if they need more energy, they can reduce the set point by, if you connect it to a uh, communication network, you can talk to all these things. And you can reduce the set point, and you're going to reduce the amount of energy required. That, that, that's the current again, the amperage? Yeah. <clears throat> so I can reduce my voltage. Uh, and in the process, I can expand the amount of energy that's actually flowing through the line. Well, if you reduce the voltage, you actually reduce the amount of energy required. To do the same job. To do the same job, essentially. Yeah. And if suddenly the wind picks up and you've got too much energy, you can actually raise the voltage. And it'll the load that's being regulated will consume more energy. So the physics of this is exactly the same as storing energy. And if your voltage drops, you pump energy in because you need more energy. Well, you just invert the logic and you go, well, if, if you need more energy, drop the voltage and you consume less. If you have too much energy, raise it and you consume more, so. which balances the system out. Because the problem for the utility is if they have too much power and the load is small, then the frequency starts to rise, and that's very upsetting to things. So you reduce the uh, you reduce the voltage, you get more energy, like at night. You get more usable. Well, it's not energy. so much solar. You want yeah. more energy to come back into those houses. This will give you more energy out of out of the same amount uh, that's entering the line. Am I right? Well, sort of. Let's just say they have. A five megawatt generator, and their load is 4.9 megawatts. The total load, in theory, if you had regulators on a significant percentage of the load, which I admit is a lofty goal, but and you lowered the voltage, it would go from 4.9 megawatts to you know whatever four percent reduction of that number is. I don't know, four and a half percent megawatts. Okay. If you raise the voltage, you would have more load than you have generation, and the generator frequency would start dropping, and that would be a problem. Mm -hmm. So the utilities challenge, and it's a significant challenge, is they have to balance the load with the, the generation. And to add PV and wind just really complicates it for them because suddenly generation is doing this when, you know, for the last hundred years it's been very flat and very controllable. And, you know, they know statistically how much load they're going to have in the peak of the day, so they turn more generators on and then they turn them off later in the evening. And, you know, they had all that stuff worked out and now the apple cart's <laughs> tipped over and they're underneath the apple cart. So this helps them. It's, it's kind of it's not, not a battery like a battery would be a battery, but it, it can make more or less out of the same. And as a result, it's kind of a mini battery. It can help them. It's a potential method to help buffer the, uh, help balance the amount of available energy to the load. Battery without a battery. Yeah, and, and I mean, one of the potential uh, value of this is that it doesn't require a battery and the battery is never going to run dry uh, you know so you know you can use this any time of day for as long as you need it and 
you know the the uh, re statutory requirements of the utility actually allow them in emergencies to go below or above this for a short period of time if they need to to stabilize the system so grid stability is a major issue for them and this can help them achieve that and it can be one tool that could help do that yeah you so know? you get a cert but you but you, you you wouldn't rely on this alone is that no, what you're saying no this is one piece of a much bigger engineering question engineering question yeah. and you know countries like germany and australia are dealing with the same issues and they've you know germany has tried some different solutions and they've kind of realized okay that gets us a little further down the road but maybe not far enough and australia kind of came along later and looked at what germany was doing and said all right well this has limitations so let's kind of leapfrog <laughs> that's the way yeah. it works right that's the way it you know, works the power so. of innovation and you know they take a little more risk and okay if it works out for them great so you learn more people will adopt it and then yeah. if it doesn't so work out are we we're not adopting this in any great numbers here not yeah. yet but you know i'm pretty persistent so okay are you the only one in the field is somebody else doing this uh no not exactly what we're doing really and so you have a patent on it of course or multiple patents yeah we have multiple patents and mm. well that's pretty interesting is anybody you know behind you looking over your shoulder yeah trying to do the same thing you know that's kind of a business question and typically what happens is the big players watch sure they these, should. these little experiments the and, <laughs> and then uh, you know if we succeed and we start taking off they'll probably just buy us of course I didn't think of that of you know course. it's it's the cheapest way for them yeah, that's traditionally yeah. the way it's done yeah well I mean this sounds pretty promising um, but but what you know for a utility um, say say Oahu okay because we don't have a statewide grid um, what would it cost to, to incorporate this kind of technology well those are good questions and of course it wouldn't happen overnight it probably wouldn't even happen in 10 years you roll it out in increments but you know you pick the worst feeder you can find and you start there and you put it in and you use it and you test it and you measure it and then you go okay let's take the second worst feeder and then the third worst and mm -hmm. and uh, you know then you incorporate the regulator into the transformer which they're beginning to do in Australia and so it progresses in the slowly surely kind of fashion <clears throat> what about the uh, you mentioned that it was autonomous but also you could send messages to it mm -hmm. uh, so I guess it's built for both of those you can do either yes yeah so uh, what, what about the notion of that I mean should we do that here should we should we put it install it with both possibilities and also message it basically it's the same unit so it's the same unit. okay no change yeah and and um would you would you put it on both ends to in order to get to the this testing phase or would you just put it at the utility end of the line the line well that points out a fundamental difference between the european system they use in australia and the u.s system so um in the u.s Typically, they'll have a distribution transformer, and they may have, speaking in residential terms, they may have six houses on one transformer. So the best implementation would be to put the regulator up by the transformer and feed all six houses. Yeah, yeah it's just a matter of efficiency. So how, how big is this device? Well, they're basically in proportion to power, so the smallest ones, which would power like a, a, a house an American house is you know like this about that deep and like this. Well, I could go and buy it right now I could go and buy one from you and put it on my house on my solar PV house right? No actually we we don't make the residential model anymore we may reintroduce it that's part of what this trip is exploring. Uh, we at the moment we make three-phase 
regulators for like um, convenience stores and small grocery stores and stuff of that nature. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a long way from, for instance, this building that you're in. You know, you couldn't just slap a regulator on this whole building at this no. stage. Could you build one that would be big enough to do that? Well, ultimately, maybe, but, but what, it's not available right now. No. Okay. And just because of the physics of it, you would probably approach big buildings by putting a regulator on each floor, because typically they run the power up from the basement up to the top. So it's the same physics we talked about earlier, that the more energy you take off of that circuit, the more the voltage drops. Mm -hmm. So the voltage in the basement here is going to be higher than the voltage on the top floor. So why did you get out of making the small ones for the single the single house and why then now would you go back into that? I mean, is it a market question? I think the uh, solar issues probably are swinging it more in a, uh, you know, it's it all boils down to profit. So for us, it was more profitable to go into like convenience stores where they're open 24 hours a day and yeah. they use a lot more power. Yeah. And you can show them better numbers yeah. on efficiency that way. Yeah. And houses really are somewhat problematic for r reasons of standard issues, but um, houses typically don't use that much electricity. So to sell it to well, you. Make much difference. Yeah. To sell it to you as a homeowner doesn't make all that much sense if you're only looking at energy savings but when you factor all the solar issues and power quality issues in you know maybe the numbers make sense that's, that's part of what I'm exploring here on this trip w wind is not part of this exploration well wind is just another uh, distributed energy resource like uh, solar Mm -hmm. So it, it could equally be of equal interest yeah. to, to to a wind developer. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm you know uh, I get the feeling, correct me, but uh, that we are when we talk to you, we are entering the world of the smart grid, and it's a, it's a difficult world to get your hands around because it's there are definitional questions about what it is, but we take a little piece from there, we'll take a little piece from there. One technology um, may not be the answer. And in fact, your technology, <clears throat> your technology may not be essential in the smart grid. It may not. And some other technology or a combination of technology. So we're, it sounds to me like we're pretty early in the game on smart grid. We don't really have it worked out yet in, as to what you need to make the grid smart as, as people expect it should be. Yeah, I mean, it, it's truly a, a conceptual, uh, it's a pie in the sky concept and pretty lofty one. And, you know, to really bring it to fruition is probably take 10 or 20 or 30 separate technologies, communication, you know, uh, metering, in America, what smart grid basically means is let's put meters in and at least find out what the voltage is. But that's only a part of it. But and I think people who believe that that's the full extent of a smart grid are, are not informed. It's much more than that. Yeah, and then when you have that information from quote unquote smart meters, then you get into real time pricing, which is all about the utility trying to not have to provide as much power at the peak because that costs them a lot of money and anything they can do to reduce that peak is very valuable so that's where you get the conversations about peak time pricing and you know there's a lot of work being done on appliances that communicate with the utility and say well we're in a peak situation, so I'm, I'm not going to turn on right now. I'm going to wait for half an hour. What about the peak time pricing? Is that your next invention? Are you working on that now? That's not anything I really deal with other than what we talked about earlier, that you could actually affect the peak by reducing the voltage if you start in the middle. Okay, let me reframe the question, Greg. <clears throat> what is your next invention? Who knows? I'm hoping to retire. <laughs>
Uh, my next invention will be small, like this. Okay, there you go. Something that I don't need a truck to move around. That's Greg Wiegand, Senior Engineer and Chief Technical Officer of MicroPlanet. He's the inventor of the uh, MicroPlanet voltage regulator, which is a very interesting device, and we know more about it, although I wish I was an engineer to fully understand. Um, and we talked tonight, tonight about uh, today, tomorrow, the voltage regulator and tomorrow's uh, smart grid in Hawaii. And this is the kind of discussion we have to have. We have to understand what you're doing, what your, what your competitors are doing, and, and how all these elements are feeding into a better grid for us. This is Think Tech Talks uh, emanating from Pioneer Plaza. I'm Jay Fidel. Thank you very much for watching, and thank you, Greg, for coming thank you, on Jay. the show. Thank you, Jay. It's a pleasure. Aloha.